The tenth video on first order responses is a tutorial sheet on system design. So what sort of questions are included in this particular tutorial sheets? What we want to do is ask how do we choose the parameters of a system in order to achieve the desired behavior? And that's why we've listed this as a design, because in design, you're trying to select parameters. Which spring would you like? Which damper do you need? What sort of thermal conductivity, etc., etc. So we're going to try and help students make links between the analysis which we've done in the previous tutorials and how we go from analysis to making design choices. Now before we start, just a reminder of some of the key things we've done on first order systems. Number one, we've said you can always represent a system in time constant form, where capital T is the time constant and capital C is the steady state gain. And you'll remember <coughs> that these parameters tell us very important things about the behavior. The time constant, roughly how long does it take to settle, and the gain obviously where does it settle to? Now, we've also known for the particular model here, assuming zero initial conditions, this is the sort of step response we get, x of t equals cu into 1 minus e to the minus t over capital T. So these two equations are things that we will use quite a lot in system design because they give us insight. First question then, and remember, before you look at the solution, what you should do is attempt this question by yourself. So what I'm going to suggest is you read it and then pause before you continue. And obviously that will apply with all the future questions. So what have we got here? We've got a tank which needs to hold 100 meters cubed and can be filled in two minutes and emptied in one minute. And we want to specify some of the properties of this tank. Now you remember that a typical model for a tank is something like this. A dh dt, so a the cross-sectional area, dh dt, h is the depth, plus rho g over r, where r is a property linked to this outlet pipe, times h equals f in. g is gravity and rho, the liquid density. So I'm going to go on now and look at the solution. First of all, we were told that we had a 100 meter cubed and we had to fill in two minutes. OK, so what can we work out from that? Well, what we can work out is that two minutes is 120 seconds. OK, and therefore what we can do is we can say, all right, if I've got to get 100 meters cubed in in 120 seconds, then I've got 100 over 120 meters cubed per second is a lower limit on f in and I perhaps should put the maximum value of f in so your flow rate has to be at least 100 over 120 meters cubed per second so that specifies the, the input actuator or where the flow rate is coming from. Now what was the next thing? We wanted it to empty in one minute. Now, given that this is a first order system, then what you can do is you can say empty is equivalent to three or four time constants. I'm not going to be uh, too pedantic at this point <coughs> because that's a decision for you to take. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll use uh, three time constants, but if you use four, it doesn't really matter. So what we've got is T is going to be approximately 20 seconds. That's the sort of time constant we need from this system. So the next thing is to say, all right, let's put this model in time constant form. And what you're going to get is A r over rho g dh dt plus h equals r over rho g into f in and clearly this term here 
is the time constant. So what you get from this specification is that 20 is approximately equal to a r over rho g. Now rho we know in general 10 to the 3, g is about 10. So in other words you get a r is approximately um, so I, that shouldn't mean 10 cubed, that should mean just 10, approximately 2 times 10 to the 5. And that gives you a requirement on the cross-sectional area times the outlet of the pipe. Now the interesting thing here is, if you have a very big cross-sectional area, then R may be smaller. Whereas if you have a very small cross-sectional area, then R could be bigger. And you might want to think why that is, but in simple terms, if the cross-sectional area is small, then you have a very deep tank, and therefore there's a lot of pressure um, pushing the water through the pipe. Whereas if A is very large, you have a very shallow tank, so there's not so much pressure pushing the water through the tank. And you'll see, therefore, this relationship between A and R is exactly what you expect. <coughs> Second question. A heating system requires a steady state power supply of 1 kilowatt to maintain a steady temperature 10 degrees above zero or outside. Given the heat capacity of the object is 50,000 joules per degree, which model represents this system? Now having done that, we get a new requirement. We want to halve the steady state power requirements and also ensure that the object could be heated up to within 5% of target, uh, 20 degrees above ambient, in 20 minutes. So those are the things that we need. Okay, So halve the steady state power requirements and ensure that we can heat it up to within a 5% of target, 20 degrees above the ambient, in 20 minutes. Let's look at the answer then. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is write down a typical model for such a heat system. So we had 5,000, that was the heat capacity, times dt, dt, d temperature, d time, plus k into t minus the external temperature equals the heat supply. Now, the first information we were given is that with 1,000 watts, we can maintain 10 degrees in steady state. So what that tells me is K times 10 equals 1,000, or K equals 100. <coughs> That's the information I was given in the question. Now the next bit said, OK, I want to halve the steady state. So how am I going to halve the steady state power. Well, the only way to do that is I need to reduce k. That's the only way to do it, because you can see the steady state power w is given by k times the steady state temperature difference. So let's reduce k to a half. So let's say k is now going to be 50. So that will reduce the steady state power, or it says W equals 1,000 will now imply T minus TE equals 20, whichever way you want to look at it. Right. What was the next part of the question? It said, all right, we want to see how quickly this will heat up. All right, so we're now looking at the time constant. All right, I've got the time constant T equals 5,000 over K, which equals 5,000 over 50, which equals 1,000. Now, the desired T was approximately 600 seconds. You remember, we said, oh, let's just check, do I mean 60 seconds? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, oh no, so I need it's 400 seconds. Let's just put this over here in a different color so we don't make it wrong. So 20 minutes is going to be 1,200 seconds, which is equivalent to 3t. That was our objective. We wanted it to get to within 5% of target um, after 20 minutes, which basically means three times the time period. So our desired time period is 400 seconds. And what we found is our actual time period is 1,000 seconds. So the only way we can heat it more quickly 
right, is basically more energy supply. In other words, increase W. The real constraint we've got here, and I'll circle it in black at the top, is this 5000. It's got a heat capacity of 5000. So if you want to get that up to higher temperature quickly, then you need more power. Third question. Acceleration of an aircraft on a runway can be approximated by a mass damper system. Given a mass of 200 tonnes for the aircraft and an effective damping of 20,000 newton seconds per metre while on the runway, determine the velocity of the aircraft and in particular what engine force is required to accelerate to 150 miles per hour within 30 seconds. So this is an interesting question which maybe doesn't have quite the same solution as some of the others. So let's go through this now. So the first thing I'm going to do is translate miles per hour to meters per second. Because if we put everything in meters per second, it's a lot easier to deal with. Now I'm going to do this uh, very approximately. I'm going to say 150 miles per hour. Now a mile is about 1.6 kilometers. So that's 150 times 1.6 kilometers per hour. There's 3,600 seconds in an hour, so that's roughly how 150 miles per hour translates to meters per second. Multiply by 1.6, divide by 3,600. Now, I'm not too worried about decimal places. You can be a lot more precise if you really want to. That gives us 67 meters per second. So that's our target. And we were told we wanted to do that in... 30 seconds. Now what I'm going to do is remind you of the formula we had on, on the second slide. What does the velocity actually do? So V of T is going to be F over B into 1 minus E to the minus B over M T. And what we've said is V of 30 equals 67. That's our requirement. So let's see whether we can satisfy that and what F is required. So V of 30 equals F over 2 times 10 to the 4 into 1 minus E to the minus. Now B over M, but maybe I'd better do this over here so we can see. So B over M equals 2 times 10 to the 4 divided by 2 times 10 to the 5 which is 1 over 10 so we've got here e to the minus b over mt is e to the minus t over 10 and you remember we've got t equals 30 so v of 30 equals f over 2 times 10 to the 4 into 1 minus e to the minus 3. So finally, if we want to solve for f, I'll use a different colour here, what we've got is f equals v of 30 times 2 times 10 to the 4 over 1 minus e to the minus 3. And if I approximate this, you've got roughly 67 times 2 times 10 to the 4 over 0.95. So that gives you an idea of the engine force required to meet your specification. And again, you'll notice we use the things we know about a first order system in order to derive these answers. Next question. A medical device for needle placement all right, can be well approximated by a spring damper with a negligible mass. Given the desired displacement distances are of the order of 1 to 4 centimetres, it may vary a bit, and the damping is typically 100 newton seconds per metre, design a spring and a specification for the required input force to give a suitable gain and dynamics which settle in the order of 2 seconds. So in other words, once you start pushing this needle, it gets to the required position in about 2 seconds. Alright, so I've put down at the bottom here the sort of equation we're talking about for a spring damper, F equals B, T, X, T, T, 
plus kx and we just need to now say how do we put in these requirements desired displacement 1 to 4 we're given the damping is typically 100 so what we need is k and f so how are we going to do that right so let's go through this um, one bit at a time so we were given that the settling time is approximately two seconds and for this sort of model over here if I put it in time constant form you'll see that I get f over k equals b over k x dot plus x and therefore t equals b over k is going to be approximately 0.5. Now it depends whether you want to take a 2% or a 5% settling time but as a practical engineer why use awkward decimal places when you can use simple numbers given that these answers are always approximate anyway and that's why I've used 0.5. Now we know that b is 100 and therefore what we get is b over 0.5 equals k or k equals 200 newtons per meter okay not a particularly strong force but that's maybe not surprising if you're putting needle into something soft like flesh okay so that was the first part now what was the second part we were told okay to find what sort of forces might be required well we've got one to four centimeters as the steady state. So if I take 4 as the maximum then I can do k times 0 0.04 equals f max which gives me 8 newtons and therefore that's the sort of force that we need to be able to supply um, with our system. Final question then, number 5 determine the components of an RC circuit which will give a settling time to within 2% of 20 milliseconds and draw a maximum current of 4 milliamps with a supplied voltage of 5 volts. Now the first thing to say is at <coughs> t equals 0 the current is maximum. The reason you can tell that is when you start there's no voltage across the capacitor so all the voltage goes across the resistor. So what we have is V equals IR at T equals 0. Now we're given the maximum I and we're given V. So if I put those numbers in I get 5 equals 4 times 10 to the minus 3 times R. And if I solve that that gives me R equals 1250 ohms. So that bit is relatively straightforward so we now know what the R should be. Next we're told we want the time constant to be 5 milliseconds. You'll see that you've told settling to within 2% of 20 milliseconds and to within 2% is 4 time constants so 20 milliseconds being 4 time constants means 1 time constant is 5 milliseconds. Now from the equation we've got we can also see that T equals RC. So what that tells me is that C equals 5 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 1250 which gives me 4 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. And there's your answer. So some conclusions. We've given a short tutorial sheet on the relationship between parameters and corresponding responses for first order systems and in particular we've asked the students to say alright given a specified response can I go from that to determine what parameters I need and clearly we've just done a few examples and this could be done with many other types of examples.